Hi, I'm Katya Soldak. I'm a journalist and the director of the documentary film The Lone Breakup. I'm also the host of the podcast series From Socialism to Capitalism that you are listening to and watching right now. To commemorate those 30 years since the Soviet Union ceased to exist, I'm having a series of conversations with people who experienced life during the transition from socialism to capitalism. And these entrepreneurs, cultural figures and business people lived and worked in those countries, the countries of the former Soviet bloc, during those unique times, when the Cold War ended and the Iron Curtain was lifted. What was it like during those wild years as these countries previously controlled by communist governments went through such a giant transition? Well, you will find out from these amazing stories told by people who were there living through it all. Today our guest is Dora Komek, a Ukrainian-American who's been involved with independent Ukraine since 1989. Dora went to Ukraine right when it stopped being a Soviet Republic, and she helped develop independent media in the 90s. Now Dora is the head of the non-profit organization Razum that works with Ukraine, as well as she is a business consultant in the United States. My name is Dora Komyak. I am a native New Yorker. I was born and raised in the United States, uh, spent most of my time growing up outside of Washington, D.C., and both of my parents were born in what is now Ukraine. So I grew up in a household speaking Ukrainian, three generations of us living in one house, my parents and my mom's parents. And I grew up every Saturday going to Ukrainian school and Sunday Ukrainian church and the rest of the week American school, just regular. I first went to what is now Ukraine um, when I was 19 years old in 1989, because that was the first time I got a visa. So since it was the Soviet Union and I was an American citizen, I needed to apply for and get a visa. I came to Ukraine for the first time in 1989, and that was just as things were beginning to change. So I got hooked. And when I returned to my university campus, I decided to do my independent work on Ukraine. So I was studying at Princeton, I was studying politics at Princeton and my junior year independent papers as well as my final senior thesis had to do with Ukraine. And after graduating, I took a job at uh, the foundation that George Soros had founded, um, the Gordon Haverlish and I uh, created a board and created the International Renaissance Foundation in KU as an independent foundation, which was a big deal at the time, and ended up working in Ukraine full time from 1991 to 1994. And since then, I have been connected to Ukraine in different ways. Uh, I live here in New York City. And then for the past seven years, I've been very involved in building an organization called Razum. So it sounds like you were there during the uh, first years when Ukraine was transitioning and establishing its independence. It must have been really interesting. I wouldn't use the word exciting because exciting is a very light word for that. You probably saw that that change is huge. It's not just something exciting it's something bigger since you did all the work investigating it was very much so and it was was literally on the front pages of the newspapers that i was reading in my dorm room because it was when the berlin wall was coming down and it was it was massive change across the broad geographic area soviet ukraine was not some abstract thing it was a place where, you know, my mom went, went, and yeah, I missed my mom when she was gone for months at a time on a Fulbright and could only write us letters because this is all pre-internet, certainly no phone calls. Um, which, you know, she would come home and have slides, slideshow photographs of my family members in Lviv. And so they were real people. It was also a very real, alive place. Um, and both my mom and my dad were involved with um, working with 
some, like when there was the thaw in the Soviet Union and some poets from Ukraine could travel, um, they translated their poetry, helped, helped them make events here in New York City and host events. So like, like I had this history, I had this, it wasn't even history, it was like, it was just, these were my parents' friends. You know, it wasn't some abstract thing out of a history book and it wasn't some idealized thing out of a poetry. So once these changes started happening, it, 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 it was thrilling because, you know, I'm 19, 20, 21 years old. You want, you want to make a difference. You want to change. And here it is. You see people, you feel... You, you, you see people are changing and, and it's an, it, was an, it was a cool, it was an attractive place to be at that point in my life. I was fortunate enough to go in 1989 um, to Odessa in 1989. I got in on an exchange program to go to Odessa as part of a bigger group. There were three of us. The big group was going to study Russian in the summer at the Odessa State University. And then three of us were going there to study Ukrainian. Really, the university has no idea what to do with us. There's a huge program for like all the other college students who are there to study Russian and they have to go to class and they have to go to the library. And then, and then there's three of us and we're like, oh, we're here to study Ukrainian. What do you got? <laughs> In 1989, there weren't a lot of people speaking Ukrainian. <laughs> they must have had some teachers and classes in Ukraine. No, no, no. We went to the beach. Literally. <laughs> Basically, the three of us, it was me and, and two two other women, were all like 18, 19, 20 years old, whatever it was. And um, and we have family in view, and we decide, well, let's go there. But of course, it's the Soviet Union, and this was where you saw the benefits of the Soviet Union kind of beginning to crumble. The system was that if you were a foreigner, you had to travel through the state tourist agency in tourist. And then there was um, Sputnik for the youth travel. And so the system was like, we stayed in this youth hotel in Odessa, which is still there. Um, but like, but once we slipped out of the system, like there was nowhere, like what, did, what were we supposed to do? So we wanted to buy train tickets. Well, you couldn't just walk up and buy train tickets because you had to show your passport. So you were supposed to give your passport to Intourist and then Intourist was gonna buy you the tickets. But we weren't with Intourist, so we fell between the cracks. So we met some guys on the beach. They bought us some um, third class train tickets in the middle of the summer because all the tickets were sold out. So the only tickets they could get us was left card, which is like, it's super inexpensive and comfort to match, meaning no <laughs> comfort. They piled us on the overnight train, the three of us bunched up along with a whole bunch of other people stacked side to side. And we took the overnight train to Lviv. And that's just when the first street protests were starting to come up. People, I remember meeting some other cousins of mine and kind of, whisper singing what is now the national anthem of Ukraine officially, but we couldn't sing it like Wow. In 89, it still didn't feel safe to sing it? No, in 89, there was, the blue and yellow flags were showing up. You see how you can control behavior through these completely mundane things. Like, so you get you know, you get potentially fired or you get demerits in your job for wearing something that might suggest a connection to something that is threatening to the Soviet system. Or you try and go from Odessa to Lviv on your own and you can't, not because there's a law of forbidding it per se, but you can't because to buy to buy a ticket, you need a passport, and to have a passport, you need something else, and to have something else, you need something else. And then, do you think you and your friends looked differently and acted differently? What was it like? We were smiling. We had straight teeth. We behaved totally differently. <laughs> we would try to blend in. Um, but this is another thing I think that that I really want to emphasize because I see people don't recognize it. Um, the the sameness 
of the Soviet experience. The fact, and it's not just that people like had one sweater, you know, that you wore all the they time did. or something, they which they did. I had one sweater. You, you the one sweater and then you had the one pair of shoes and that was it. Um, but it was also like how people carried themselves, you know? People wouldn't smile necessarily. You'd never show your teeth. Um, it was, there was just a kind of, just a way of carrying yourself. Because the three of us talked about it, and especially like when we were on that train, like we didn't want to get robbed. We didn't want attention drawn to ourselves, which we completely failed at. It's actually strange to hear because 1989, in my perception, was already the year when freedoms were becoming available. I mean, not 100%, but I know that the Soviet communism, the grip was sort of like loosening up a little bit. But as a foreigner, you probably could not really tell because it still, it, it was pretty Soviet. There were still, I mean, there were the, still the hard currency stores versus the non-hard currency stores. And you had the, you know, Kashtan, the shop in Kashtan, that's where you could get all the stuff. Um, and then the other stores didn't have anything, but you could still get stuff if you knew somebody. Um, so it, it, you know, the giant signs on top of the buildings and neon that, you know, would say in Russian, I remember in Odessa, každý člověk imaje prava na oddech. And it was like a quote from the constitution that every man, every citizen has a right to a vacation, mm -hmm. you know, and these giant hammer and sickles and just all this imagery of just. Wow. So all yeah. the symbols, they were like right in your face. It would basically look very Soviet. I understand why, because there are monuments everywhere and symbols and all these slogans. Yeah, that's true. You get used to it, so you don't see it. But when you came from the United States, you know, it was the evil empire. I, I'm, you know, I grew up with Reagan as president. You know, it was you know, the Cold War. All these movies. I just rewatched again the movie White Nights with Mikhail Baryshnikov and Gregory Hines. I mean. Just that imagery, that all that messaging, and yeah, it was so that Soviet sameness is something that I think people have kind of forgotten. That like people, so, so people, you know, you'd have to wait in line um, to buy things. To buy things, people had a common experience of either if they were a guy, army service. Yeah. Or, or everybody, if you were a university student, you know, you'd have to stop your studies to go work the harvest. Yeah. But the harvest wasn't really the harvest. So like that kind of, the, and, and you'd go into any restaurant and the restaurant menu would be the same across 11 time zones. You know, you'd always have the, the chicken Kiev and it was just the same sameness. If I remember correctly, the restaurants were not even for people to go and like get food. It was to go and celebrate big occasion. You don't just go to have your lunch <laughs> to a restaurant. Right. But if you're traveling, you got to eat. And there was <laughs> That's true. From my first visit in 1989, when it was a bit controversial whether I can go to this protest in Lviv, and one uncle was very much against it because I could get in trouble because people had just gotten beaten up and arrested. And my aunt was like, I'll go with you, let's go. You know, and I remember where I first saw the, this group of people with these blue and yellow flags. And then the next summer I went and went to the, um, I took a bus trip to, from KU to Zaporizhia. It was the 500 years of Kozakstan. And then already things had really changed, just massive thousands of people, tons of blue and yellow flags, people really trying to figure it out. Um, and then in, I returned to do research on my thesis and then I returned to work. And I was thinking that this was right in this time where I was able to experience a, a, a society that was sort of freed from the shackles of Soviet Sovietism, I almost hate to call it socialism because it was sort of Sovietism, it's like socialism screwed up. Read from that, but 
not yet with the constraints of capitalism. So still, there was this period of creativity. So, so it was this bland, gray Sovietness where you're death by a thousand paper cuts, where you have to wait to get a stamp for everything, where, where if you want to move your career forward, you have to leave because the good jobs are in Moscow, you know, where the people who are running the country don't set the strategy, they're implementers, they're middle managers in corporate state, right? They're the middle managers running the country. All the people who aspire to be leaders, you know, were, had already been killed or exiled or emigrated or by their own volition went to Moscow because that's where the good jobs are. And then everyone who had the potential, not everyone, but most of the people who had the potential were so suffocated by this administrative repressions that, you know, how could you leave? How could you innovate? So, so you had this country run by a bunch of middle managers, right? Where all the decisions were made elsewhere. Um, this boring blandness. Um, and then as things start to change, you have this period where where the, there are no roles, you know, and, 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 and I was fortunate enough to work at the Soros Foundation, at the International Renaissance Foundation right then and focus on media because that had been my work. I ran a nationally syndicated radio show when I was in college. So it was my passion, it was my interest. And so we um, created uh, basically an incubator for, 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 for television project and we founded um, Intranews Ukraine, which has been active in Ukraine since then. And we founded a news agency called Union, which operates today. And we had a TV program called Vikna Windows that was the first alternative to state television news. Don't get into details, but if we transition from what was called socialism to more or less capitalism through this period of time when absolutely cor correct and I agree with you no rules tons of creativity it's like no restrictions because nobody knows unless you come with rules from the west and try to follow western rules but it's hard to implement in a country where it's not really enforceable so maybe you can describe a little bit how you because there were only state channels at that time before the yes. Soviet Union ended. Maybe one exception, like I know in Kharkiv, we had an um, alternative TV channel that was created in 1989, maybe somewhere else. But mm -hmm. a little bit more about the, the work that you've done for that particular aspect. Angle. Sure. So exactly as you describe, right at that time, there were some, some non-state TV channels popping up. And they took in different cities and they took different forms. Sometimes they were able to broadcast by using a local transmitter in a city. Sometimes it was as simple as creating a cable TV station. And a cable TV station was someone who was able to buy a VCR, a video cassette recorder, a tape player, which is hard to get, but let's say you were able to buy one, buying one of these cassette players and literally running cables to every apartment in that building. And then the TV operator would put a cassette into the recorder and it would play to everyone who bought cable. So it was cable television. <laughs> And then it, you know, it expanded. So these things were popping up in 88, 89, exactly 90. Um, so by 91, 92, there was already some of this innovation happening around the country. From a news perspective, there was the news show on the official channel. And there were like three official channels nationwide. And so what we did was we, we brought together journalists who were working at State TV and producers and editors and sound engineers. And we created something that was basically a weekly news show that we distributed around the country by cassette. So again, cassettes were really hard to buy. Like you had to import them and they were expensive. So we would have, we would create a show and then we would, 
put it on train and the train would take it to another city and someone would take it off the train and then play it in that city and then put it on another train and it kind of it went around the country that way and that's how we created this network of tv stations and then later on we satellite dish and it changed but but it was this is what i mean by this kind of level of creativity initially people kind of experimented with us and would do stuff on the side but it was a big big deal when one by one we convinced these important journalists to leave their jobs in state TV and the camera, cameramen and editors and producers who to sign on with us where, oh, by the way, I was getting grant money and then we ended up getting, but, but you couldn't wire money over. So we'd have to just carry cash on your person I you remember counting out bills and looking at it and going like I could buy a car with this and you know it, it was just crazy was um, it in dollars this, or in what kind of monetary unions because I know that at the same time the economy was collapsing and Russian rubles stopped operating so what what was that like I'd, I'd get dollars and convert them into coupons and then pay people in coupons. it was crazy I mean I think about it now and I'm like if anybody who I mean I had like belts, waist belts, just money. There's no other way to bring money in. Then there was a lot of excitement. Um, we we did attempt the revenue model for the show in that we sold advertising, but that was hilarious because nobody knew what advertising was. And there were law firms that funded some of it. But, you know, in hindsight, that's where we dropped the ball was the media revenue model. They didn't, didn't put it together fast enough. Um, at the time, though, remember, there was both this feeling of like leaving, leaving the sameness. There was also very much a sense of nobody knew how long this was going to last. Like the window was open and you didn't know when it was going to slam shut again. Um, remember, like really the last thing people could compare it to was the thaw of the 60s in the 1960s. And that got slammed down with the 70s repression, throw caution to the wind, run as far as you can, as fast as you can. Yeah. And so the, and America was cool, right? And Soros was cool. And all the work that I was doing, it, it was like in my, in these ventures that I've been talking about, I was usually the only non-Ukrainian in the room. Mm -hmm. I was also oftentimes, um, the only non-male and the only non-smoker. So <laughs> it was a bunch of guys with unfiltered wet tobacco cigarettes. But they smoked I, anyway, so you were probably a passive smoker. Uh, if you looked at my lungs, you would probably be like, Dora, what do you mean you weren't a smoker? I mean, the amount of, and it was those awful, like they, the tobacco was damp and it wasn't filtered. So it had this... Okay. Batra, exactly. <laughs> but, but my point being like, it, we weren't, we were clearly an American funded thing, especially once we founded Intranews Ukraine and Intranews is a nonprofit in the United States. Um, but the, the Soros Foundation was the International Renaissance Foundation and Soros was coming to the country fairly often and, and meeting at high levels and stuff. And keep in mind that this was, Keep in mind how cut off Ukraine had been for decades. So like all the academic exchanges, all the cultural exchanges, they were all centered on Moscow and best case scenario, Leningrad, not St. Petersburg. People would come to KU for a day trip or something. So like, so, so Ukraine was cut off from any exposure really to the, to the US in a direct way. Would you say that you and people from your foundation or other enthusiasts who cared about Ukraine at that time from the West, do you, would you say now looking back that you had high hopes for Ukraine and uh, would you say that maybe some of that was naive or not? Great question. There definitely was a euphoria. There definitely was a euphoria. 
I would say that, you know, since I was born in 1969, and since I was in my 20s when I was there, I had an advantage over people even 10 years older than me or 20 years older than me. And that advantage was that I was just getting to know the country, so I didn't have a ton of preconceived notions. Whereas people who were further along in their careers had more preconceived notions of what was supposed to happen once Ukraine became independent. And then when that didn't happen, it was kind of heartbreaking. What do you think they expected uh, from Ukraine? What was like more or less, um, you know, not standard, but sort of general expectation from the country that became independent from the Soviet Union after decades of oppression and being part of that system? So there's, there's a, a, you know, to put it into business speak, there's a market segment in the United States inside the Ukrainian American community that has spent a generation sheltering an idea of Ukraine. And it's, it, it's, it's a generation of people who may have been born in the displaced persons camps during World War II, Maybe they were born in the United States shortly after the war, and they grew up in a Ukrainian American community that was protecting the language and the culture and really protecting the idea of Ukraine, of a pre-war Ukraine. And, and this is particularly strong in Halishina, like in, in Western Ukraine, like this idealized version of something. And so, I think for people who grew up in the United States, but with this tight Ukrainian American community and this identity, that they're among some of the people I've spoken with from this market segment, there was this expectation that once Ukraine became independent, this thing that they had sacrificed for and were working for was going to happen and it was going to be beautiful. And there was a bit of a disillusionment when this idealized perception collided with reality, right? And the reality was 70 years of people living under a Soviet system, you know? I'm like, oh, it doesn't even matter. Like 70 years, 70 years of people actually living in reality versus an ideal. And whenever you take an ideal and a reality. So I think among some people, like, People were jarred by the fact that I think if people thought they were going to just seamlessly blend right in and be on the same wavelength, and then you realize, well, you're not even speaking the same language, even if it's Ukrainian. Um, when I came to the States, I got my MBA and I went into corporate America and I went in pretty deep. Um, I kind of put Ukraine to the side. I sort of needed to detox a bit. I think my expectation, I didn't allow myself an expectation because I kept expecting the window to be flat shut. We're still transitioning from like controlled society, planned economy, everything is run by the Soviet government to something more free market, you know, freedoms of speech and uh, economic freedoms, freedoms of expression. Uh, do you think Ukraine succeeded in that transition from your point of view, especially since you experienced those years when it was going through that transition. And now you can look back and see, and you're pretty much in touch with Ukraine all the time. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I, I think Ukraine is succeeding. Mm -hmm. I don't think Ukraine has succeeded yet. Uh, not out of the woods yet. But the reason I'm so excited about Ukraine right now is because I feel it has so much to contribute to the rest of the world in this particular sphere, in the sphere of, of civic engagement and of being able to, to operate. So among my peers, and I'm 51, so among my peers, I still hear things like, 
the government should pay for culture. The government should pay for the schools. The, why isn't the government solving this? How come the government doesn't have the vaccine yet? How come the government doesn't? And when I work with people in their 20s and 30s, there's much more of a innovative, tech savvy, I'm going to solve this problem kind of thing. And this is the biggest change or one of the biggest, one of the bigger changes after after the revolution of dignity, after Euromaidan, is this sense of like, I'm in this and and like, I need to fix it. It's, it's not someone else's problem, it's this responsibility. So it's the mindset that went from thinking that everything belongs to someone and someone needs to take care of it, otherwise let it just rot or steal. Mm -hmm. And now it's more of a, this is my territory and I'm going to take care of it. And it applies to other things as well, not just your house or your apartment exactly. building. Exactly. It's an evolution into something where there's personal responsibility and, and common, common responsibility to personal responsibility. And, and it's, this, it's this tension. And this is where I think you know, every society has to figure this out and constantly be calculated. And this is where I think Ukraine can teach the United States a lot, especially after our Trump administration, of what is your personal responsibility. Do you think uh, other countries that left the Soviet Union, other than, you know, I understand the Baltics, they had a very different experience and they're part of the EU right now. But do you think all these countries that separated from the Soviet Union, they all had a similar um, evolution in a way that they went from expecting the government to take care of you and give you things to more or less independent uh, mindset and entrepreneurial mindset and uh, taking care of yourself uh, kind That's of. That's an excellent question. I would love to explore that question. I don't have the data, but the thing that I keep coming back to when I think about Ukraine and Ukraine's transition in contrast to the other republics is there's sort of two striking differences. One is the size of Ukraine in terms of population, in terms of land mass and in terms of population. It's big. It, it's big. It's much bigger than many of the other republics. It's not as big as Russia. It's not as big as Kazakhstan, but it's big. And in terms of population, it's big. The other thing that I'm in, that I used to discount, but I'm now more and more intrigued by is Ukraine has a global network of people who are connected to Ukraine in some way. So all over the globe, there's someone who's connected to Ukraine and who identifies as being connected to Ukraine. It can be in the form of the traditional diaspora communities like the Ukrainian American diaspora. I mean, keep in mind that in the United States, there are Ukrainian American organizations that are over 130 years old. So like half the existence of the, of the United States, there are Ukrainian American organizations, let's say. So there are some longstanding connections institutionally and as individuals, and there are people around the world who have different perspectives, but who have some kind of connections to Ukraine. And I know that is not the case with people from the Russian Federation, because of as, as prevalent, because I've been approached several times by people from the Russian Federation who are like, how do you guys do it in Ukraine? How do you guys, you know, how do you, you know, how does the Ukrainian American community function? So, so there's, this is kind of a superpower kind of thing. Thank you for listening to our conversation with Dora Komiak. I'm Katya Soldek, and it was an episode of our series From Socialism to Capitalism about life in the former Soviet bloc after the USSR collapsed 30 years ago.